My name is Inigo Montoya. You kill my functor. Prepare to die. Welcome to a Programming Languages virtual meetup post-recording. My name is Connor Hookstra, and in today's video, we're going to be covering Chapter 8 from Category Theory for Programmers by Bartosz Maluski, entitled Functoriality, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. We're going to start off by looking at a tweet from Saturday morning, roughly a week ago, where I tweeted out, it's 9 a.m. and I've been studying category theory for an hour and a half since 7.30, and this is how it's going. Functor, happy face, bifunctor, slightly less happy face, covariant functor, straight face, contravariant functor, sad face, pro functor, even sadder face, hom functor, crying, and then while watching Bartage's lecture that corresponds to chapter eight he mentions the diagonal part of the bifunctor is just a functor at which point we have two crying faces so this chapter is definitely the most difficult so far i said that about last week's chapter on functors and we continue to build with the chapter eight on functoriality but we're going to get through it so as we have been doing for the last couple of videos we're going to take a look at this graph or diagram from a talk called category as a tool of thought or category theory as a tool of thought. This is everything we've covered up until this point, minus chapter seven, where we covered functors last chapter. And now we are covering a uh, sort of the family of functors. So this isn't on the diagram, but I added bifunctor and profunctor. Um, but I was watching some follow-up videos on functors, uh, a video that is specifically called the extended functor family, which is fantastic. It's by George Wilson. Wilson. There are two different versions that you can watch. I watched the 25-minute uh, version from Yao because it was uh, slightly better quality. The links for both of these will be in the description. And in his talk, there is a diagram that shows the functor family. So if we switch this to dark mode and we enhance it, it's a little bit more legible now. I'll read through them. It starts with invariant functor at the top and then going down to the left, bifunctor, functor, applicative, biapplicative, alternative, monad, and monad plus. And then on the right, contravariant, and then two arrows, one from bifunctor and one from contravariant, leading to profunctor, which leads to strong choice, then category and arrow, and then underneath contravariant directly is divisible and decidable. So we can combine the two of these diagrams uh, like so, and now we have a, a work in progress uh, ultra diagram. So hopefully by the end of this chorus, we'll even have um, composed a couple more diagrams to get the pent ultimate diagram. And if we draw an arrow from functor uh, between the two diagrams, we can highlight them as so. And this is what we're going to be covering in today's chapter. So bifunctor, profunctor, and contravariant. It doesn't explicitly mention, uh, explicitly mention covariant, but that's just because it's everything that we've seen up till now. And note that there are is a little bit of duplication between these two diagrams. Everything in yellow slash orange here shows up in both diagrams. And uh, as one sort of bonus, I watched this video by Bartosz Maluski that he gave at Lambda World in 2017 called Profunctor Optics, which is about the lens library. And it sort of covers the uh, profunctor subtree in the functor family tree that was presented in George Wilson's talk. This is a diagram from that talk. I'll be honest, I understood like 5% of it, so I probably watched this video a little bit prematurely, but I'll revisit it once I have a stronger grasp around some of these um, functor ideas. But let's hop into the table of contents. So here we are, chapter eight, functoriality. We've got bifunctors, pro uh, co product and co-product bifunctors, functorial algebraic data types, functors in C++, the writer functor, covariant and contravariant functors, profunctors, and the hom functor. We are going to touch on bifunctors, uh, covariant and contravariant functors and profunctors, and we will leave the rest uh, to the watcher or the listener um, to follow up in reading the chapter. So we're going to start off with bifunctors. The text reads, since functors are morphisms in cat, the category of categories, a lot of intuitions about morphisms and functions in particular apply to functors as well. For instance, just like you can have a function of two arguments, you can have a functor of two arguments or a bifunctor. On objects, a bifunctor maps every pair of objects, one from category C and one from category D to an object in category E. Um, so if we take a look at the code that is presented in the text for bifunctor, it is basically a type class where we have three different functions, bimap, first, and second, and you actually only need to specify bimap, and then first and second can, first and second can be derived, or you can uh, vice versa specify first and second, and then bimap can be derived. 
And for me, the most useful thing to uh, understand these is to just look at a couple of examples. So here is the uh, bifunctor either, where we are just mapping, we have sort of uh, two pattern matches for our bi map definition, one for left and one for right. And given two functions, f and g, f applies to left and g applies to right. And if we follow this up with uh, sort of more in practice um, examples, I found this uh, super, super awesome, uh, a super, super awesome example that came out of the meetup last Monday, where we have by map being performed on a tuple, which is a sum type, or a product type, and then either a by map being performed on an either, which is a sum or coproduct type. So for by map, we have uh, two unary functions, plus one and times three. And when you apply this to the uh, two tuple, AKA a pair with the values two and three, you get two plus one, which equals three, and then three times three, which equals nine, which is what you can see on the right. And for the by map that's uh, applied to an either type uh, with the same f and g functions plus one and times three, for a left three, you end up with three plus one is equal to four. And for a right three, you end up with three times three, which is equal to nine. So hopefully walking through these two examples of applying by map with two functions, two unary functions to both a two tuple or a pair and an either sort of makes it clear what a by map is doing. So a by map is just sort of two functors um, combined together. Moving on to covariant and contravariant functors, I'm gonna put this up on the uh, slide or on the screen, but I'm not gonna read through it. It's just sort of the precursor to what's gonna come next, where the text states, considering that FA is the same as GA and FB is the same as GB, the whole trip can be described as GF colon colon B to A uh, with an arrow and then GA to GB. It's a functor with a twist. A mapping of categories that inverts the direction of morphisms in this manner is called a contravariant functor. Notice that a contravariant functor is just a regular functor from the opposite category. The regular functors, by the way, the kind we've been studying thus far are called covariant functors. So uh, in my opinion, this is super confusing because I didn't understand sort of the previous uh, text or the, um, you know, following paragraph, but we discussed this in the meetup and it's actually pretty straightforward. And for me, the easiest way to visualize this is by sort of talking about an example from a talk called The uh, Power of Composition by Scott Walosh, which we're going to get to in one second. So for the type class contravariant, we basically have a contra map, which if you compare this to uh, your functor, you'll note that sort of the A and the B and uh, in, in the type signature of contra map are reversed. And the way to visualize this, like I said, is from a talk, this is a fantastic talk. Uh, Scott Walashen is a uh, pretty well-known individual in the F-sharp community, and I think in the functional programming community um, uh, in general. And he has this fantastic talk, The Power of Composition, where he shows this idea of railroad programming. So if we zoom in on this a tiny bit, basically it's showing that if you have a function that uh, takes an apple as input and outputs a banana, and you have another function that takes an, a banana as input and outputs a cherry, you can compose these together and then end up with a single function that inputs an apple and outputs a cherry. And this composition that we're looking at here is an example of a functor, because if you recall from chapter seven, when we had the reader example, um, uh, the map or F map was basically just the composition operator. So in F sharp, that's the uh, or less greater than greater than, but in Haskell, it's just the period. And basically uh, that functor is an example of a covariant functor, um, but a contravariant functor is basically the following. Instead of composing things sort of at the back, you're composing things at the front. So where we were uh, composing uh, sort of a banana to a cherry function, uh, with an apple to a banana, for a contravariant, we want to basically do the opposite thing. We want to compose something at the front. You can think of this in terms of sort of consumers and producers. That was one example that one of the meetup attendees really liked. Uh, for me, I like thinking about functions. And what's complicated about this is that for functors and bifunctors, we've been thinking about it in with the idea of containers where you can sort of, uh, for a functor, you can F map over a list or you can F map over a sum type like an either. Um, but for these uh, contravariant functors, the idea of containers as it applies to sort of containers like lists and some types and product types, it doesn't work as well. And the best way to think of it is the container is a function um, that is has an input and an output. And so a contravariant is just basically composing at the front, whereas a covariant is composing at the back. I'm probably sure my terminology is not uh, exact and the mathematicians may be upset, but uh, my mental model for this is what's on the screen, and it works well for me. And as I've mentioned in some of my other talks, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, that was a quote from, I believe, uh, Box, who is a mathematician. I could have that wrong, but 
Um, this is my mental model for it. So we'll move on to pro functors, uh, which the text reads, we've seen that the function arrow operator is contravariant in its first argument and covariant in the second. Is there a name for such a beast? It turns out that if the target category is set, such a beast is called a pro functor because a contravariant functor is equivalent to a covariant functor from the opposite category. A pro functor is defined as the following. So this is just a lot of words that don't make sense to explain that if you are if you have both both basically uh, contra map and f map, aka you are composing both to the front and the back, uh, you have a pro functor. So it's the combination of uh, a bi functor and a, a contravariant functor, which is what was shown in the George Wilson diagram uh, from the functor family. So if we go back to our diagram from uh, Scott Walsh and sort of railroad programming example. Here we have our functor, and if we combine this with our orange to apple, this gives you the pro functor. So hopefully that makes sense. And if we take a look quickly at the Haskell code from the textbook, uh, pro functor, similar to bi functor, has three uh, type signatures in the type class. Instead of bi mapped first and second, you have di map, l map, and r map, which similar to bi functor, you only need to define either di map or l map and r map, and then the uh, reverse can be sort of reverse engineered. This, I believe, brings us to the only exercise that we're going to look at or challenge that we're going to look at for this video, which is the following. Define a bi functor in a language other than Haskell, implement bi map for a generic pair in that language. And here is a very simple solution to this challenge in C++. I'm taking a shortcut in that um, instead of defining the type signature for a generic function of any type to any type, I've just hard coded it um, to go from int to int. Uh, but uh, you could design a more complicated version that would be uh, harder to understand. But here we're using C++ 20 concepts, where we have a concept by functor that requires uh, for BF, it implements uh, a by map function. Uh, which takes f and g, which are going to be two unary functions from int to int. But like I said, you could do this more generically from any type to any type. And it has to return a by functor as well. And that's constrained by the type name b that's passed in the templates here. And so if we define our struct pair, we have uh, two members, a and b, and then we have by map that's defined to take f and g. And we are just going to apply f to a and g to b, and then construct a new pair and return this. And we're done. So this is uh, pretty cool that we get to use C++20's concepts in order to answer this challenge. And that brings us to a very quickly covered uh, summary of chapter 8. Um, as always, check out the two lectures that correspond to chapter 8. They are fantastic. And although the content is getting more difficult to grok, um, Bartage's videos are, as always, an excellent supplementary resource to working through the text. With that, I'm going to end this video. I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed. And I look forward to covering next chapter on type functions. Stay tuned for that video.